All right, guys, welcome back to the Rick Shields Golf Show podcast, everybody. One episode 174. Um, the players has been on this weekend. Mm-hmm. It feels like golf is everywhere at the moment, and there's lots and lots to talk about. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I always do that. It's, <laughs> it's like trying to get bloody blood out of a stone. Um, I like to make you work for the first like minute. You have to put a graft in. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not quite feeling it yet today. Monday morning, kind of not not fully operation on full cylinders. So um, why? We'll see what happens. Not sure. Life's busy, isn't it? Busy. Life is busy. Well, annoyingly, we've come in the same jumper today. That's that's one reason why it's a bad start today. <laughs> we um, it very rarely happens considering we have a lot of the same Lyle and Scott gear. And how good is Lyle and Scott gear, by the way? It's very good. Um, we've both come in black jumpers, which is a bit frustrating. <laughs> so if you're listening, don't worry about it. If you're watching, we apologise. But yeah, there's a lot going on this weekend, and we have got an absolute jam packed podcast for you today. Um, and the talking point you'll see from the title, uh, we'll come on to in a moment. But could Rory McIlroy leave, potentially leave, TaylorMade Golf? Oof. We've got a few little conspiracy theories and a bit more of a broader topic as well we'll come on to um, a bit later on. But yeah, the players was this weekend. I said on Twitter, I got some love and some hate for it. I think we should swap the USPGA, it's no longer a major, and replace it with the players. With one totally caveat, agree. all the live players who are eligible could play in the players. Yeah. So your Cam Smiths and DJs will be there. I totally agree. I think out of all the tournaments, the one there's, you know what? I don't know whether kind of the, the, the PJ tour or social media are doing a better job of hyping these tournaments up, but it's been a couple of real big events. I've really enjoyed this year. Genuinely is the um, waste management mm-hmm. um, at Scottsdale yep. and the players just thought I'm, and Bay Hill as well. Bay Hill was like Arnold Palmer invitational was really high on the agenda as well, but the players, I mean, it is just a phenomenal yeah, tournament. It really is. Well, it's got that cliche being the fifth major, but it, it quite literally is, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's the biggest event, I think, in most people's eyes, bar obviously the majors. Uh, the golf course looks pristine. And this this narrative we've got now, which we're looking to have, of obviously Scotty Scheffler, uh, John Rahm and Rory, like these three guys who uh, all kind of weirdly deserve to be world number one. Yeah. That makes sense. In any other era, one of apart from Tiger, one of them would be world number one kind of all the time, but it's so competitive. And there's just such a strong, deep field at the moment. But yeah, it was, um, I think as well, I said to you before, off, off podcast, but for us in the UK, the time difference was perfect yeah, as well. It's about really five good. hours behind. So it finishes at like half past 10 in the evening for us. It's not too late, obviously, but it's on in the evening so you can kind of chill and watch yeah. it. For me, that is the perfect time to watch golf. Yeah, in the UK, a lot of the, when it, whenever it's, they're playing in Florida, it's definitely the best time zone for mm. us. Um, the, the, like for example, the uh, Phoenix, Arizona, the waste management that was only just about good enough time because they teed off mega mega early because of the Super Bowl. Mm, Where yeah. often when it goes kind of west side, it is much harder to watch because it goes on till like silly clock in the morning over here. But I mean, just the place itself. We'll come on to the break seventy five shortly. But the place, the venue, the the high caliber of golfer. The, the fact that you've you've got that drama around the finishing few holes. I mean, it is just amazing. Big names like Rory McIlroy missed the cut, yeah, which is a real, real shock. Certainly because he's won round uh, Sawgrass as well. John Rahm pulled out because of injury, yeah. uh, in, uh, illness. I think it? it was yeah, illness or injury. I think it's illness, which um, which was a kind of a weird mix up as well. There was there was loads and loads of stories. Players such as um, uh, Hoge. Is it Hoagie who finished, he had a 78 first day, um, kind of matched the same score I had at TPC Sawgrass. Exactly nice. the same score. Uh, he nearly missed the cut after two days. He ends up going finishing third or something yeah. silly. He had an unbelievable weekend. He shot the course record Tyrrell Hatton on Saturday. Was insane. Tyrrell Hatton shoots like silly numbers on the back nine. Was it seven under seven on the back under nine? Seven under the back nine. I mean, that's just a I was joke. watching that live. I, I, I watched a lot of his round. Certainly towards the end, they're obviously showing more and more of it. He just... So good, yeah. So so good. In in an interesting character, Tyrrell. He was one of the first. He said it's that one of the first times he's been seen smiling on the golf course. That shot on eighteen. I don't know if you saw, yeah, it. I did. It, it was amazing, absolutely ridiculous. But he's kind of a weird one, Tyrrell Hatton, because he's he's obviously an English guy. But I kind of feel like he's somewhat. I don't think of him that much as being an, an elite, like top top. But he obviously is. Do you yeah. know, I don't quite know what. It, maybe if you can get over that and win a major, you'll kind of put him in that kind of bracket. Of but He's always in and always, around, isn't he? He's always. so good. I mean, you looked at the leaderboard last night and there was a point in time where I think there was either four, I think it was four English golfers in the top yeah, 10. Tommy was up there. You had Tommy, Justin Rose, Tyrrell Oh, he's the same putter or similar putters, those two. And who would have been the fourth? Um, I'll have to get the leaderboard up. 
there was definitely four players who were in the top ten at one point. Um, this is going to annoy me. Have I forgot? So Tyrrell, def- obviously. Yeah. Uh, Justin Rose. Um, Tommy. Tommy. And then who else? I can't maybe, think- maybe there was only three. I can't think of another English. Aaron Rye. Aaron Rye. Was he, was, he, he was kind of doing decent with his two gloves. So what's the story behind the two gloves, by the way? I think it's all, from from what I understand, I've met Aaron a few times. He's coached by uh, pal, pals of mine, me and my golf, Andy and Pears. I believe he just, when he was growing up, he always wanted to play these two gloves. They're kind of like, they are literally wet gloves. Yeah. And he's just stuck with them. I like it. Yeah. I, I, he's such an interesting character. Like, yeah, head covers, iron, iron. iron head covers. You know, he, he uses two gloves. He's he's one of the hardest workers in the world of golf. Like, he really grinds and practices. Incredible holding one on Saturday yeah. at the players. There was three holding ones this tournament. Just never been done before. Really? I don't even think there's ever been two in the same tournament. Oh, wow. So to have three in the same tournament, um, it, it was phenomenal. And then, unfortunately, on the Sunday, golf, the reality of golf bit him back in the bum cheek mm. in the fact that I think he made a double or even a triple on the 17th on the Sunday which would have cost him a you, number of pennies. Do you not think it just shows that, like, there are some golfers who have some little quirks, i.e. Aaron Rye wearing two gloves, and you get the odd f- funky swing, a, a Jim Fiore being one that springs to mind. But actually, as golfers, certainly at the elite level, they are so similar in so many ways. Like, why do we just wear one glove? Think about yeah. it. Like, why? Obviously, I understand why it's the hand that, you know, is on the golf club more than the other hand. But, like... It's so rare that one guy wears two gloves. Everyone takes a glove off when they put in. Puts it in the puts back, in the back right pocket. pocket. It's just like, it must just be a bit of a fashion thing. Because back in the day, obviously the da- Jack Nicholas days, they would put with the glove yeah. on. And then obviously, I don't know who it was. Like, there is a guy though, I think he's kind of famed being the first one who took it off, put it in his pack, back pocket. And now it's a done thing. You know what I don't get as well, which all the top guys do? How they can play golf with the massive, huge yardage, yardage books in the back pocket. It is huge, It's isn't massive. It? Yeah, it's they like a, all it's like have. an iPad in your back pocket. They all, you're right. They all have those massive yeah. books in the back pocket, don't they? And I just don't know how they do that. And you know what? I've got loads of those yardage books. I've never. I, I would not want them in my back pocket no. playing golf. No, I really wouldn't. Or a small, like normal size one. Yeah, but they've got massive, like holders. They're obviously, a scorecard in there. The thing is, it looks cool, doesn't it? Mm, it does look quite cool. I think it looks really and I love cool. What I always like as well is when they, they put out on the 18th, they walk to the bag and they get the boss watch, the Rolex or the tag and they put that on because like obviously the sponsor makes them. It's like, yeah, it's quite cool. You know what I think they're really good at as well is, I, I don't know about you, when I've ever played golf and I'll get home that night, I've always typically got tee pegs in my pocket, ball markers, pitchforks when I'm get, taking See, my trousers off That's later. where we differ. Oh, do you clear it all out? So as soon as I finish, I'm all out. I like oh, wow. it to be, I'm really precise. So golf ball is back in the bag. Save for another round. It might last another hole or so. Uh, T straight back in, pitch foot back in. Oh I have to be God. clean, yeah. I you, I do you leave yours in? Yeah, honestly, the amount of tee pegs and, and ball markers and pitch forks and old golf balls I've got near, even golf balls, I'll have a golf ball in my pocket still, till way after the round of golf. Yeah, I don't like that. It's weird. Not a fan of that. <laughs> when we play golf, I'm sure you just pull out one tee out your bag at the start, don't you? Or do you get a handful? Um, I like I'll, I'll a, get about two or three. Okay. But that's it. I'm a five or six guy. I like that's a bit of I like quite commitment. I like quite a few teas in there. You know what I have got though? I've been clearing out my garage recently and I've got these like little um soft almost like goodie bags, they're like little pouches. And I've been I've put in pitchforks and ball markers. The amount of pitchforks and ball markers I've got <laughs> is scary. Like, yeah, when I come and play golf, I can everybody find one. Yeah. How many times have I used never in a video? Wrench, which is annoying. In a video I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds we'll of wrenches. We'll be filming a club review on the golf course. You're like, I just want to take the loft down. I want to just ch- change something or whatever. And it's like, got a wrench? No. She no, doesn't carry a wrench. I've literally got wrenches. The, the problem is I've almost got too many of them. You know what you need? There was a few seniors at my golf club back in the day. They may still do it. When they're playing golf, they'd have a towel attached to the trousers, right? <laughs> and then they'd have like um, one of those like winter tees with like three different levels yeah. of pyramid tee on. Or, you, or, you need or a little, string together. Yes, correct. You need a little wrench attached to your belt. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it probably goes back to a point I made a couple of weeks ago. I feel like sometimes when there's too much choice, I don't make a choice. Yeah. And that's probably similar to wrenches and ball markers and pitchforks. When there's too many, I don't make a choice. Yeah. Um, however, probably the biggest story has to go to Scott Scheffler. It does. I mean, what the hell? I was looking, I think it, the, I saw a stat online. I think it was something along the lines of, and this isn't going to be perfect, but um, it was something like he's he's won six events in like 391 days, whatever it is. And there's only, I think, two other guys who've done that either. I think it was obviously Tiger and Jack Nicholas, and I can't remember if the stat was just win six events in 400 days or 
the first 400 days from winning the first event. If that right. like, either way, it was some crazy, crazy start. And that like you said before, I think again off podcast, kind of thought it might be a bit of a, a one season I, I, wonder. When he went on that that run last year, I thought we'll never he'll do this. He'll win the Masters, and we'll never hear of him again. Yeah, was I wrong? You were wrong. I mean, to be fair, after the Masters last year, he didn't set the world on fire. No, he had. Well, he didn't win again until no. But then obviously he goes and wins the Waste Management, goes and wins the TPC Sawgrass. Two huge events. And probably, again, going back to this kind of publicity, two of the biggest golf events that have happened so far this year. You know what's really interesting, though? I don't know if you've experienced this yet. I went to a party on Saturday night. I know it was a party. Don't get invited. <laughs> there, was a few, um, there was a few non-golfers there, and we're chatting about golf and blah, blah, blah. And they said, you know, who's like the best in the world now? And they reeled off. A few, and I said, well, have a guess. So I let them have a guess and the, the typical names came out that what I'd class as household names. Obviously, some of them guessed Tiger, some of them guessed like Rory McIlroy and a few others. Mm. And I was like, Scotty Scheffler. And they went, who? Mm. I went, Scotty Scheffler, the guy who's, I don't, never heard of him. I'm like, this is madness, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I think, like you said, it, it takes a while for somebody to um, burst onto the scene and then almost transcend into household name yeah. I think if he was English that'd be a different story I bet so many more golfers would be, sorry non-golfers would know Danny Willett is because he won the Masters and yeah. it's on the TV it's on the news it's on the front of the newspaper whatever so it will probably take a while I wonder if that's different in the States though yeah I must admit that the, the friends I was chatting to on Saturday night they were all kind of English um, so they were, they were, a lot of them they were talking European names yeah I, I think Tiger being the exception I would imagine that in America it might be a bit different because obviously when you win the Masters it's a massive massive deal and naturally whatever country you're from is going to be very proud of it as Japan were and Matsuyama won etc and I imagine Spain were when obviously Sergio won I bet he's got he's bigger but you're right it takes a long time to come out of that kind of um, in, within the sport to then become a household name outside of the sport um, but I mean I saw something online, I was reading a comment, somebody said he's going to end up in a world, a Hall of Famer. And somebody almost said, well, he is already, which isn't probably quite true. But you look at his career, you know, he's won, he's won the Masters and five other PJ Tour events. I mean, what what does determine in your eyes a great? Because you look at like a Montgomery or Lee Westwood, obviously famously have, have never won majors, but have won almost everything else he can win and been so strong for so long. Is it that that determines a, an amazing career? I mean, if... If Scotty Scheffler retired tomorrow, God forbid he had an injury or just said, I'm sick of golf, does he go down as a great mm. winning the Masters? Like, what does he have to do to become a great? I suppose they, they will, obviously, the Hall of Fame will have kind of rules to get to induct people into the Hall of Fame. But for me, I wonder if it, if it is that kind of longevity. Mm. Like, but, but then again, you, you'd look, you're dead right. You look at stacking those three, to, three careers up on, on top of each other. Westwood, Montgomery, and now Scotty Scheffler. And you would, it, it'd be a good argument to say Scotty Scheffler has achieved more in his golf in that, in, it's certainly in the time frame. In the, oh, in the time frame, no question. But it's but. like, but you can't look past, obviously, what Westwood did in the, in the world of golf, what Colin Montgomery did in the world of golf. Like, even though they didn't win majors, they won bloody almost everything else. Well, that, that, that's the point. And, it, and obviously, in golf, we have the four majors. And we, you know, they are the absolute pinnacle of the sport. And I, I imagine they always, always will be. And within that, you could almost argue, you know, I may argue that the Open and the Masters are kind of the two more elevated ones. I don't know. That's just a feeling that I have towards them. A lot of Americans, rightly so, love the US Open. I think most people, when you see in polls, do rank the PJ the, the lowest. And I'm not too sure why on that, but it doesn't get us quite as excited, does it? But to win the Masters is a massive achievement. He's done it already in his career. Yeah. So you think like if you go even if he goes on to have an okay career and wins once every couple of seasons for the next twenty years, I mean that would be that's oh, another yeah, ten events. Cool, like with a mate with the masters in the bag as well. I mean, who knows what he's gonna go on to do. It, he's just it, you know, when that run like yesterday, I mean he, he was we we're gonna come on to a few other stories in a moment, but like he got to as he was approaching about nine, he wasn't really setting the world on fire. He was kind of plodding along. I think he parred every single hole up until that point, maybe even bogeyed one early on, and then just went on a run of making five birdies on the Same. bounce. Like, what the hell? You don't think about doing that. Well, you can't. Like, <laughs> Sunday of the players at Sawgrass, to be able to birdie five holes back to back, yeah, to extend your lead significantly over your competition. You know what's mad? This is a stupid shout. I almost can't see him not winning the Masters. Yeah. Like, why is he not going to win the Masters? Exactly. He doesn't seem right now to have a, a flaw no. at all. 
He doesn't ever seem phased about pressure. He's obviously shown that loads mm-hmm. of times. I mean, look at even the shot. He stood there with the world watching, stood on the 17th yeah. tee with a lead, yeah. granted, but often that's harder to defend. Mm-hmm. Like when you've got such a significant lead, you almost get a bit sloppy, don't you? Yeah. He stands up there and just hits a wonderfully professional beautiful shot into 17 it feels like he could potentially it's early to call this and i know it's it's a bit of a cliche making tiger comparisons but he has that feeling about him that kind of cool and calm and collected feeling where he could go on to be one of those guys that if he's leading a tournament that's just it like when tiger was leading the tournament it's just it isn't it it's over like he's won but what what's bizarre about scottish effluent he doesn't seem to have a superpower like going back again to those days where tiger used to win his suit, we had a, a number of superpowers, but like his dis, massive distance off the tee. Irons, he's put in his... He had this formidable um, performance on like birdie in the 72nd hole to win a tournament. Like Tiger had those kind of superpowers. Normally he was so dominant when he was playing against other players that, that they almost like fell away mm. because of that. The Scott, only, he doesn't seem to have the that. The only way I could say that he does is like when he chips in. Yeah. He's in these rubbish places. You're thinking, you know, he's going to have to get up and down. He holds it. I mean, that's he does that. It seems like he does that a lot. I think he chipped in three times in the in the few days, which is insane. But yeah, I don't know. He, he just seems to have everything. Maybe he that is. So he's just so rounded. But, you know, it, it feels like it's it's a great um, it's a great time for golf. It is a shame, I'll be honest, although I'm not super passionate about Liv, that obviously Cameron Smith's not there. Would have been great to see him there as defending champion. It would have been good to see DJ there. A couple of others from Liv, but I they're, did, they're I the did two. definitely, again, this tournament, because it does feel a bit elevated than just a normal PGA Tour event. You're right. I would have loved to have seen a few of the more household names be playing. But does that, though, even more so excite us for the majors? Because the four majors a year now are going to be the only time, maybe by the Ryder Cup, where we see these guys who will live and, you know, at PGA Tour, DP World Tour, competing together in the same field. That's going to be massive. And imagine if a, a Cameron Smith wins the Open again or wins the Masters. Imagine what Liv will, how they will shout about that, because they will. 100% Liv will talk about that. The, the best player who, who won, you know, the green jacket or whatever is on their tour. It's exciting. They'll probably get all the wrong side of the draws. Yes. They'll be going out. <laughs> <laughs> They're going out at night, at night in the dark, <laughs> playing night golf. Uh, we've got to also touch on our friend. Yes. Podcast Fan, uh, the fan. <laughs> He's a huge Don't think fan. He is a bad fan. Podcast uh, guest, friend of the show, Minwoo Lee. Yeah, oh my days, what a player. What a player. We called it, didn't we? We did. Said it earlier. I mean, the round he had on Saturday, 66, to put himself into contention. I mean, I felt like I just wanted to reach out to him last night and like hug him and go, it's all right. Like, because obviously it was difficult to watch him, that front nine. Yeah. The seven he had on the fourth. I mean, it was just like, oh, it's gut wrenching. Because you know, he has got such an incredible talent. He is going to win PGA Tour events without a question. He is going to win majors, in my opinion. And you look at him, you go, oh, but hopefully he learns from that kind of day. 100%, but I do feel like, it, although he kind of, some degree, kind of fell away, obviously, I do feel like Scotty Scheffler won it as well. Though. He did. Didn't feel like, I mean, we lost it necessarily. But yeah, I, I was going to do a tweet last night, I couldn't be bothered in the end, but... We, we've been very fortunate, obviously, in the last few years to film with some amazing golfers, haven't we? Adam Scott, Lee Westwood, you know, the list goes on. Most people watching, listening, can know who we're talking about. And before that, in my old job, I got to play with some great golfers, meet some great golfers, watch them on the range, etc. Honestly, I would say that day we did um, the Break 75 at King's Barnes and you played, obviously, Min, Min-, Min- Lee was arguably the most impressed I've ever been with a golfer in real life. Now, admittedly, he played out of his skin, so naturally you're going to be impressed. But he's just got it all. Yeah. So There's long off weakness. the tee. Yeah. He, he, when he, he seems to cruise in fourth gear off the tee, and then when he wants to rip one, he's got like yeah. a turbo six gear. Yeah. Like he just absolutely turns it on. Um, I love seeing him birdie 17 yeah. last night. He played, he, I think he hit one of the, the best shots into 17 yesterday. Makes birdie. Big, I love how he got the crowd G'd up. Big smile on his face. Like, you know, that hopefully he takes those positives. He still came tied six. Like it wasn't it wasn't no, a complete disaster. Gained a lot of new fans, I think, as a well. A lot of new fans. He, I think he gets into Va, uh, the next tournament, uh, Vars, Varspar? Valspar. Valspar, this week coming up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he has got an incredible future in the Do game you think of it's, golf. A, it's a shame? Not a shame, it's, it's kind of the natural progression, but somewhat a shame that for DP World Tour players, it is the, the natural pathway that you kind of leave the DP World, well, not leave, but you move on to PJ Tour. Yeah. Because that's what everyone wants to do, don't they? Let's be of course honest. They do. That's where the money is. Yeah. 
It's where the money is. It's where the best players are. It's where you get to play the best golf courses. The best, more All eyeballs, country, really. more sponsorships. Yeah. Really, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? And and even when you look at the actual scheduling of PGA Tour, you're right. You're not as many times on a plane. Yeah, you you obviously have to jump around, but like they do the Florida swing, yeah. they do the California swing, they do you know all these different. So you're in an area, you're in a count, uh, not a county. What are they called over there? A state, a state for a period of time. You know, and while you're playing these different tournaments. Um, but yeah, it's it's exciting times. You were telling me just before about how it, why it's his two iron so, so long. Yeah, I saw a thing online again. I don't know if it's true or not, but it sounded true. When he plays his sister Minji Lee, who's a two time major champion. The only rule that she has is that they'll play off the same tees, um, but he can't hit his driver off the tee. And I, I guess it must be his three-wood as well. So he hits two iron when he's playing against her. And he, I mean, I'm sure his balls were just like 160-odd plus anyway, which is like our driver. But he absolutely destroys that two iron. He's so long. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to do another cliche of, again about Tiger. And I don't know what it is. So I can't put my finger on it. So it's not the best point I'm going to make. But there's something about him that gives me a bit of a Tiger vibe. I don't know what it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it's his kind of, his physique almost at the yeah. early, you know, 1997 Tiger and just kind of slender and slim, but kind of toned it. Maybe it's that, I don't know. But there's something about him that gives me that little bit of a vibe. He's, just, he's got that ability to impress yeah. on, on every situation. Like any shot he plays, where again, probably going back to this kind of superpower of Scottish Scheffler, I never feel like he really impresses me with mm. a shot. I never go, oh my God, that shot's, nobody else in the world could do that shot. Tiger could do that, yeah. and I feel like Min Wu Lee could do that. Do you know, you look at Tiger's greatest 10 shots, and they're all where he's in a bunker, yeah, and it's, it's like a horrible lie, and, he cuts and he's got to hit it over a tree with a three iron, and, you know, all those, like, unbelievable golf shots. Tiger had that ability, and I feel like, again, Min, Min Wu Lee has, where, again, I've not seen it. Scott Sheffield just doesn't seem to have that superpower I think some, but also he doesn't need it well that's it sometimes those amazing shots come after a bad tee shot always so Tiger as great as he is at golf and always was obviously he was very capable of spraying it and then that's where you get in these mad positions but speaking of golfers who uh, are impressive to watch there's arguably nobody more impressive than Rory to watch him drive the golf ball he is arguably the best driver in our lifetime would you say yeah I can't think of anybody that is longer straighter be more consistent with it Potentially. Yeah, you could probably throw in maybe DJ into that mix, but yeah. but Rory is, He's up is, there. is, is in the, the conversation, isn't he? Well, there was some, and title of this podcast, as, as you've seen, you might just skip to this point, so hello if you've just joined us. But um, could Rory potentially be splitting up with Taylor May? Now, it's a bit of, this is a bit of kind of um, speculation, but there's, there's some evidence maybe behind this or some discussion behind this. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Um, there was quite a, a, a popular clip this weekend because Rory missed the cut this weekend. He shot five over par and for the two rounds. And there was a clip of him um, doing the rounds. We might insert in here briefly if we can. Yeah, I wish I didn't have to bet on a new driver. I wish I could just use the old one. But um... And it, he says this, this basically. Yeah, I wish I didn't have to bet in a new driver. I wish I could just use the old one, right? So lots of people saw that clip and put two and two together. And he um, won uh, the Dubai Desert Classic in January and he was using a stealth driver, not the stealth two. And we talked about that in our um, podcast at the time. And, you know, you could argue, well, so what? TaylorMade don't care as long as he's using a TaylorMade driver. And that might be the case. But we also know, as been proven by today, when an athlete wins with a stealth two driver, TaylorMade shout about it, as they have done with Scotty Scheffler, and rightly so. They're paying these guys a lot of money, so they want to shout about it as much as they can and talk about forgiveness and blah, blah, blah. But basically, Rory has had to switch out of his stealth, the original, let's call it stealth one for now, into the stealth two. And that's why he said this quote, um, I wish I could just use the old one. So lots of people were thinking, all oh, right, so TaylorMade have told him enough of that old one, you have to be in the new one. Now, his apparent reasoning, the reason he is saying it is because everybody knows, even if you're not super nerdy, that golf clubs have a limit with the driver face and um, they get tested out on tour. So every now and again, they will get tested at random and the RNA or the USGA might pick Rick Shields' driver if he's in an event and test the face. And if it's too hot, that driver is deemed illegal. Um, you'd have to put another driver in play. You could get penalised if it was post around or whatever. It, it depends on the situation. But Rory is saying that his stealth one face is potentially borderline 
hitting that kind of illegal uh, territory because obviously as he's hit it so many, so many times at such speed, that face actually does become faster, which there is some truth in. We've seen that. I mean, um, people online have done that test before over a long time. So that was he's saying that he's had to take the stealth out and then put the new one in because the old one is getting maybe too hot. I didn't want to take that risk because if it, if it did turn out to be illegal, it would look very bad for him and very bad for TaylorMade. So, I mean, is that the truth? Or is it the case that TaylorMade have said, look, you've had a bit of fun using the old one, you've won with it, great, but you have to be in the new one. TaylorMade um, pay him roughly, we believe, around $10 million a year to use TaylorMade clubs. A day. <laughs> a day, an hour. And in um, 2022, last year, he re-signed for a multi-year deal. But I think one of the things that changed in that deal was that it wasn't a 14-club deal anymore because he's currently using Vokey wedges. So he's moved away from TaylorMade wedges and he's moved into Vokey wedges. So ultimately, you know, let's be honest, it's, it's, he's saying there, <clears throat> for me, for, for Rory... I don't believe TaylorMade Wedge is the best. I want to use the best for me. Therefore, I'm going to use Vokey. And that's part of his deal. He's allowed to do that. He doesn't seem very happy about the fact that obviously he's now using the Stealth 2 and not the old Stealth 1. Is this going to cause a bit of friction? Because TaylorMade have also done a tweet, again, rightly so, um, shouting from the rooftops about um, Scotty Scheffler using their driver. So they put a tweet out saying, never a doubt, Scotty Scheffler captures the player's title trusting his Stealth 2 driver to tame Sawgrass in convincing fashion and move to world number one ranking. He led the field in driver distance and was second in strokes gained off the tee. Hashtag Fargiveness and a lovely graphic. Pretty much all the comments below are people talking about Rory. Good thing he spent money on uh, Rory. Get Rory a Titleist driver. Um, Cancelled my Stealth 2 order. Is there a discount for the old one? Rory convinced me to never buy from TaylorMade. Um... Someone's put, Rory McIlroy, where you at, bro? Um, then someone else put, let's have a conversation, Rory, about drivers. The list goes on. Now, I know Twitter is full of potential trolls and people having a bit of a laugh. But this isn't good for TaylorMade, is it? Where, where does Rory and TaylorMade go from this? It's um, it's a very interesting time for equipment manufacturers and players right mm. now. I, I'm not sure if I've ever known a year where there's been so many controversies and players using old drivers, new drivers. Um, I mean, it, was it Colin Mon Ka- Morikawa, who again is a tailor-made athlete, is currently using the Sim 1 driver. Correct. Which is what, four years old now? Well, so 2023 is the Stealth 2, 2020 to 2020, I believe it launched. So, you know, that that is really rare. Yeah. Now with TaylorMade, they've pretty much always had this kind of policy when they bring a brand new driver out and you always see it at the... Um, Champion, um, the one, the event they play in Hawaii, um, champions of champions, whatever it may be, that pretty much every single tailor-made player, athlete, paid, you know, sponsored player will put the brand new driver in the bag. But over time, some of those drivers have been moving out and old ones have been going in, Rory McIlroy. I mean, that, that surprises me that he said that out in public. Yep. It really does. You'd think he'd kind of just keep that under his hat and not really say anything. Um, he's obviously very, he is outspoken. We've seen that with his relationship between PJ and Liv. Um, I don't think it will massively hamper the future of Rory and Taylor made. However, I'm saying that now, who was the other player that mentioned who did something similar to this about a year or so ago? Bryson, Bryson D. Sham, Bo. At a time where he was using Cobra golf clubs, he slagged off the driver yeah. and said he, he couldn't get it working. Lo and behold, less than 12 months later, he has now ended his contract with Cobra. Yeah. Has he ended it? Have they ended it? Who knows? Um, but it certainly, there's no smoke without fire. Well, also, on- I think this comment with from Rory it might just be a little bit of smoke. Well, also on this as well, this is from golf.com. It's a really good article. Um, this is from Thursday's round. So obviously he missed the cut on Friday, but from on Thursday, it said the upside though for Rory, was he still gained 0.7 strokes on the field with his driver. So his driver was actually kind of working on Thursday um, put him in, it putting him inside the top 20 in that category. He actually struggled more with his short game and putter um, where his strokes gained were minus 2.6 with his flat stick, right? So his putter was off. So again, I'm not kind of trying to, you know, make things up here. 
if he's not putting well and he's not enjoying his putter and he's not always been known as being the best putter, Rory, he can be off with it. But then I started thinking as well, you look at Taylor May, some of the best athletes. You've got um, Scotty Scheffler, Taylor made athlete, uses Scotty Cameron. You've got Tommy Fleetwood, uses an access putter or access, whatever it's called. And obviously, you've famously got Tiger, who uses his Scotty Cameron. We can always put that to one side. He's never going to leave that putter, I don't think, although he has dabbled. But you think, well, if Rory is using a putter that he's, he's not massively playing well with, or he might want to swap, he might not do. He has to stay with Taylor Made because that's part of his deal. His wedges, yeah, he's moved out of. His irons, he's got to use Taylor Made. It's obvious that he's got to use his Taylor Made, you know, driver. And he has to apparently, looks like he has to use the latest one. Now, he's getting paid $10 million there or thereabouts, we believe, a year. Taylor Made are in their right, it's sure, to say, use the latest gear. You know, Rory is playing this game, as he says, why didn't join Liv for, for legacy and to win tournaments, not necessarily for the cash. Why don't they just say, you know what, I don't want 10 million, keep me 10 million quid a year, I'll play what I want to play, and I'll hopefully win more tournaments. I think, yeah, I, I would totally understand that. Again, from, from a point of view, he could be completely brand neutral now, which a lot of players have gone to, and he could use any golf clubs he feels fit. I think the only thing now that would that would make me believe they want to also be with a manufacturer is what Tommy Fleetwood said in the podcast with us about how in, important the manufacturer was, almost being their... Um, like an F1 mechanic. Correct. They, they are almost so on their numbers, like Chris Trott from TaylorMade will be so on the player's numbers all the time that the player doesn't even have to really worry about mm. it too much. You know, almost they're being looked after in this kind of, like say, F1 style where they go to the go to the mechanic and go, please help me with everything I need. And the mechanic already knows everything that needs to tweak. Where you do lose a bit of that if you go completely brand gnostic. Yeah. But I'm also pretty convinced Rory McIlroy could go out and employ the best club fitter in the world to, to work with him. You beat me to it, exactly. To work with him 100% of so, the time. Exactly, Rory could say, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to employ X person. He could say, come, Chris Trott, come Yeah, you can work with me. I want to have a mixed bag. Clearly, if he went with Callaway for some irons or whatever, they're going to let him on the tour truck and fix his clubs up for him. Of course they are. So you're going to get that same service. You're going to have a custom fitter that's personal to him, like a coach, like a short game coach or a long game coach. I mean, obviously these guys, they want the cash. Why would you not want $10 million a year to play with golf clubs? But when these things are your tools, surely you just want to use the best that is for you. And we know that all the brands make good gear. But sometimes, like with Roy with that first stealth, you find the driver that you love. And it might be the case. It might be honest that it's the case that it's getting too hot and he, he, he thinks it might become illegal. I'm not sure if it is the case because surely you could just find another stealth one that was similar to his old one and, and you can put that into the bag. We've also seen as well this week that uh, Victor Hovland, who's a ping player, has a ping head cover, a G430 head cover on his three wood. It's actually a stealth, stealth two, I believe. So he's kind of using not what it looks like. And he's using Rory's hand me downs. Yeah, exactly. They've swapped. And then also, we, we've seen that he said Bryson now, he did a What's in the Bag on uh, YouTube. He's using pretty much all ping stuff now, which I don't know if that would be a, a paid thing or not, if he's just found that for him ping are the best. But by does... the way, on the, I didn't watch the full video. I kind of watched a bit of it. I've not watched it fully yet. Is he also using single length clubs still? So he's got single length ping irons, yeah. He's got the LA Golf putter. His driver, he's got a stealth and a ping, which he's going to have as a backup and switch between. Um, but it was very ping heavy. But it just makes you think as well, doesn't it? Like, it, again, it's so obvious, but these guys playing with certain brands because they're getting paid. The, the other thing as well, if you looked at it from Rory's point of view, let's say, it, you know, reportedly getting $10 million a, a year to be with Taylor Made. On top of that as well, TaylorMade will have requirement days for him mm -hmm. where he's got to do commercials, he's got to do media, he's got to do, you know, all these things. Rory might go, well, actually, I can't be bothered doing these days. I'd like mm -hmm. to say for $10 million, it sounds ridiculous. To, to you and me and to everyone listening, we're thinking, what the hell, you'd never turn down $10 million. But for him, he's like, well, I've already got however many millions in the bank. I could go and sign with, with somebody, regardless of, like, he could make $10 million somewhere else, mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean he has to sign with a club manufacturer. Yeah, Do correct. you know what I mean yeah, by that? Correct. Like he could go and sign a new company. If, he could sign a new endorsement for a new car company yeah. to tomorrow. Land Rover, whatever it might and be. And get $10 million, $10 million from that. Mm -hmm. so, and then he can still use the equipment that he wants. Well, that's it. And I also, this is a, a take, it's a, probably a step too far, but hear me out on this. We we also think, and we, we see, it said it's a lot that 
like Scotty Scheffler winning with South too is, is, is great PR for Taylor May. They can shout about it. And, and to some degree, that may or may not excite consumers who might this weekend coming up go, you know what, I'm going to go and try Stealth 2 now. If it's good enough for Scotty Scheffler, it's good enough for me. But we also know that's not really how the world works. As I said, when I worked for Nike, which I've said many times, I know, but people didn't buy uh, Nike clubs because Tiger and Rory used them. It might give them encouragement to try them, but if they didn't perform, they didn't like them, they wouldn't buy them. Could there ever be a time, that this is probably never going to happen, let's be serious, but could there be a time where brands stop paying tour pros and they say, you know what, rather than spending 10 million on Rory, 15 million on Tiger, 5 million on Scotty Scheffler, the list goes on, we're going to save that money and we're actually going to go to the marketplace and, and spend that money in other ways. So, for example, that $10 million that we save on Rory will utilise... To, to sign sa- Rick Shields. To sign Rick Shields. <laughs> will utilise to travel the states, employ a load of people and set up demo days at loads of golf clubs and get these clubs in people's hands. Think how much they could do with $10 million. And what would be more powerful to the average person watching Rory win with TaylorMade or having an unbelievable experience with TaylorMade staff trying the product maybe again playing a bit silly here but maybe if they're not spending all this money on athletes they could slightly reduce the price points potentially with the money they're saving that could make them borderline a bit more affordable might sell more units i don't know do you know what i think there's an even important point to this genuinely what everything you've just mentioned there i agree with there's one more absolutely more important thing when taylor made are trying to make their new drivers who are they trying to make it for exactly for the best players in the world Mm -hmm. Well, how many of those are there? Yeah. Yeah. You and me, everyone listening, we we can't use those pieces of equipment. I genuinely believe I found that with Stealth and Stealth 2. Mm-hmm. I can't use a Stealth 2. Yeah. It, for me, I, I'm not fast enough. I don't hit it in the middle enough, personally, mm-hmm. for me. So, you know, if you're an 18 handicapper, you probably, again, I'd like to think you're not going to enjoy Stealth 2. I'm not saying you can give it a try and whatever. But for me, if TaylorMade then parted ways with every single man you know um uh athlete would they even change the model of golf clubs they would be making well that you know potentially yeah i mean obviously in the irons they kind of bro, most brands do that they have an iron that a tour pro might use which is typically a blade or a small cavity and they might have big chunky things the average guy you know in drivers they do that to some degree like stealth hd is more forgiving but you are right i think stealth's been a standout driver that is for the average person hard to hit so if they are building those for the, for the tour guys, they're not the most forgiving out there. But it's interesting, isn't it? And I don't know. It's it's. Um, I, I, think I, I think too many brands make product for tour players. Yeah. And they don't make it for the average golfer. Good point. Because for me, again, going back to this point, like let's say f- next year, TaylorMade bring out the TaylorMade... Stealth 3. <laughs> <laughs> Powered... No, it's Powered. the TaylorMade... Smasher, okay? Yeah, okay. That's realistic. So what's going to happen? <laughs> Is it? I believe they should be making the tailor-made Smasher for next year for a 12 handicapper. Mm-hmm. You know, that their absolute flagship model for be, should be for more majority of golfers that play the game. Would they not argue that that's what the, the loft sleeve and the weight can help you do as well, though? But, mate, put all your R&D into that product. Mm-hmm. Then make a tailor-made... What did I say? Smasher. Smasher TP. For your tour player. Yeah, fair dues. Because that, that's a take that's so specific. Make it smaller, make it faster, make it more forgiving and uh, less forgiving, blah blah blah. Uh, but that's for only ten people in the world yeah. who are going to be able to hit that driver. Well, that's good. Good little conversation. I'd love to hear people's thoughts. If you watch this on YouTube, feel free to jump into the comment section below. If you watch it, sorry, if you're listening in the car, whatever, email us, podcast at rickshields.com. On that, I've got a couple of good questions from the Facebook group. And the first one, which aligns to what we've talk, been speaking about, is from Kieran Hodgson, who says, what clubs is Rick contemplating adding to his bag this year? I think you alluded everything. to last week. Yeah, but that's it. You said everything. Give us a bit more. I don't want anything left in my bag. I don't know. Putter, I think you're a, you're an even, you've got an even roll putter at the moment. You've had several iterations of essentially the same putter for a long time now. I think you're always going to have a soft spot for that putter. I'm kind of go back to it. Not sure why though, because it doesn't really work for me. I know, but it's the shape you like, isn't it? I think you, you could go something a bit bigger, maybe, and then kind yeah. of switch back. But I think you could be a guy that's got two putters. You've got like a bigger one that you sometimes use, and you go back to that potentially. You know what? It sounds daft. I don't guy. I almost want TV's to... gone off, Matt. By the way, sorry, it doesn't matter. We'll continue. I almost want to start from scratch. Okay, like properly get get rid of everything. Like imagine tomorrow, <laughs> I lose my clubs. Yeah. All right. Well, God forbid they get nicked. Yeah. That's almost the stage I want to be in. 
<laughs> right, so I'll go into the car park with a crowbar. <laughs> I just feel like I, I want, for whatever reason. Your driver's good. I, I know, but I don't know if it is. <laughs> I feel like I just want to go and just start everything You've again. You've been really good for probably the last 18 months at not swapping clubs very often. 18, I think I've not swapped clubs often for the last four years. No. I hardly ever low. swapped clubs. You've had <laughs> Titleist 200 now. Before that, you had TaylorMade MCs. Before that, you had a few sets of Wilson. Do you had Ping Blueprint for a while? Yeah, but that's not many, is it, really? <laughs> <laughs> You've had that's K- not many. Cobra drivers. No, I think... Hmm, depends. What about three wood? Yeah, would that the, needs to oh, change. Would it go? Yeah. Okay. I don't hit it. I want a four wood. Four wood? Yeah, I don't mind that. I want some... I don't, I don't know what I want, but something, you've swapped. something this is, that's going to help This is me. the thing, though. You've swapped clubs less since you've played more golf. I think Correct. that's because when you're out on the golf course, we've said this before, when you're out on the course and you've got a decent score going, you don't look down at your driver and think, oh, God, it's two years old. You look down and go, this is working at the minute. I love this driver. I yeah. love this putter, whatever. When you're just playing every now and again casually, that's when you're in the stage where you go, I'll put a new putter in the bag, I'll put a new driver in, just for a bit of fun, which is fine. Um yeah, I don't know why. I've got itchy feet of maybe just move, changing everything, but who knows? I'm excited for that. If Taylor made want to spend some marketing. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, I th- yeah, we'll see what happens. Okay, Jack Leonard has asked us, thoughts on playing from the red tees to build confidence? I've heard Bryson mention it numerous times. Yeah, well, he mentioned about doing it when he was a kid to help him, you know, get better at shooting under par uh, when he didn't have a particularly huge amount of length, distance. I, I like it. Mix mm. it up. Yeah, that's something I think we've done a bit more when we've been playing golf, even just casually off camera, not obviously going off the forward tee necessarily, but playing a bit more, like more forgiving tees. Yeah. Because I kind of started golf and quite quickly got into competitions, which I'm, admittedly were only junior comps at my local club. And they weren't, you know, super serious, although I felt like they were at the time. And, and in that, you know, you played off white tees and it was all like proper and obviously stroke play or stable third and keeping a scorecard and all that kind of stuff, which I enjoy. But because of that, I, I feel like now every time I play golf, it has to be the hardest course possible. And it doesn't, does it? If not, no. if you're playing for fun. I, I, I like a 6,500 yard golf course now. Mm. After after being punished at places like Bay Hill off, off like 7,400 yards and playing places like JCB off the bat tees and a number of places now I've played off the proper bat tees, it's not that enjoyable. You know what's quite cool? So I met some friends yesterday, went for a bit of a, a walk around a, a park. And one of them's a golfer. And he was saying that he'd recently been up to Sillith with his brother to play at Sillith and then went and played Windermere and he really enjoyed it. And he said when he played at Sillith, him and his brother played the front nine, uh, Texas Scramble, as a nice. bit of like a, a laugh, and then back nine had a bit of a match against each other. He said, and he said, oh yeah, you know, we always used to play like quite competitive and take it quite serious, which I kind of enjoy, but it's a bit, sometimes you can't be bothered. And then I thought, you know what, like, so many of us do go out and play the same format every time. You yeah. go out and you play stroke play or you play Stableford. We've got a video coming next Friday, Break 75, where we play Texas Scramble against the golf course, essentially. Yeah. It's so much fun. It was, it was, it was definitely a, a more kind of energised way of playing golf. 100%. Um, got an email for you. So got a couple of emails for you. If you want your email read out, listeners uh, or viewers, email us, podcast at rickshields.com. Um, give us a bit of clickbait if you want. That's normally a way of enticing me to, to get into them. Not always, though, but sometimes it does. Um, <clears throat> you ready for this, Rick? I am. <clears throat> Hi, Rick. After 30 years as a weekend hacker uh, and a year of early retirement and more golf, I can finally see a single figure coming, handicap coming. I am down to 10.5 and expect to get that below 10 before the end of the autumn here in Australia. So this listener, David, is from Australia. Um, good night, mate. <laughs> I can't resist. That's just pathetic. You want to do yours? <laughs> no, Go I'm on. not. Go I'm on. Not. Good day, mate. Nah, rubbish. That wasn't uh, too bad. That was bad, really. Joking. Um, my question for you is, what reward should I give myself for this milestone? My golf mates say that new clubs are definitely in order, and I thought I would share my bag with you and get some thoughts on what would be the best thing or things to replace. So, you ready? I'm going to do it like freestyle it live. Driving three wood, it's got Taylor made M1. Okay. I don't think I'd swap them. Nope, they're good. Hybrids, it's actually got three and they're quite new. Taylor made Stealth, four, six, and seven hybrid. Okay, interesting. You, you know, the new. Okay, this is what gets interesting. Irons, seven to pitch and wedge, Nike sling, blah, 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 slingshots. So old school. Really old school. He's got a Cleveland, couple of Cleveland wedges and a Vokey, which they're all 10 years old. That could be interesting. And then Putter is a Taylor made Spider X. Okay. So, first thing I would say before you come on, Rick, if he's playing well and his handicap down, it might not always be the best thing to swap your clubs because they're kind of working. 
However, if you want to treat yourself and get some new clubs, Rick Shields is now going to give you his advice. <laughs> I don't think the longer stuff you've got anything to worry about. Correct. Driver three wood hybrids are fine. The irons, the Nike slingshots, I remember reviewing those years ago. They're very, very hot irons. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and sometimes as you'll start to get a bit better and hit, find the middle of the face a lot more. And I've, I've seen this on a number of power irons. Sometimes those power irons can go a little bit too far. So it might be worth you looking into a more kind of, um, kind of, I'm trying to think of a, of a good recommendation. Something that's not maybe more like, like a P790 a, maybe. Yeah. P790 a- or even like a ping G. Yeah. G iron or something like that because that's the ping G iron have got quite similar shape into the slingshot, so it won't be too different looking down on, but it's not got a big bulky back yeah. to it on the slingshot. And then definitely some new wedges like 10 year old wedges, you're probably starting to wear out the grooves a bit there. Exactly. Treat yourself to some new wedges and putters fine, yeah. 100, I'd agree. I'd but def- as Guy mentioned, you don't have to swap, but it sounds angle, like you're on track, yeah. The other angle is maybe the wedges, if they are 10 years old, there could be an argument your, your grooves aren't as, as um. Sharp. sharp yeah and you might lose a bit of spin and control um but ultimately if you're playing good golf i mean yeah. the, the other option would be is don't get any new clubs and maybe treat yourself to go and play a golf course that's like ridiculously maybe something that's expensive or one you've always wanted to play or maybe go on a little trip i don't know and do something that way because yeah, yeah you never know you might get a new club and it's, it's nice thing to treat yourself with um but then equally it's like if it doesn't really help your game you're going to resent it and lastly, you said, um, appreciate your thoughts from David Fleming. And then he put, uh, it was quite funny because I thought that's what the pro Presswick called, David Fleming. Yeah. And he even put himself, the club golf from Melbourne, not the golf pro from Presswick. Although I was born in Scotland. So, so funny. There it is. I've got another email for you. Um, some, we, we've had this kind of similar vibe before. So I'm going to ask you anyway, because I feel like depending on the day you're having, you might give a different answer. So today, yeah. you're actually in the perfect mood for this because you're in a bit of like a Monday morning mood. So I'm quite <laughs> interested to see how you, you answer it. It says, ask Rick, should I say something? I mean, it's actually say called something. Dear Rick, really. So for that and alone, we shouldn't really be reading his email because it's wrong. It's Dear Rick, it's not Ask Rick. Oh, but yeah. it's fine. We can let him off for this uh, once. And this is definitely a uh, anonymous email. So I cannot read his name out live. Okay. So. I feel like when I, when I say that, I want to read it out because it's like it's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, okay. Hoping for some advice, as this has been bothering me for a while. I took up golf a year ago and started playing with a relative and keeping the specifics a bit hazy because I know the other three people involved are also regular listeners. I'm walking a tightrope here, so please let me rena- remain anonymous. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we were playing a golf course that was pretty water-laden a while back, plugged balls, wind conditions, etc., We were able to lift, clean, and place. About five holes in, I saw one of our group drive a ball to the base of a tree. It was almost unplayable, and he would have had to chip out a couple of feet to the sides and give himself a decent shot to the green. I saw him lift and clean the golf ball, but then place it six foot away from the tree (laughs) in a much more favorable spot. He had no idea I'd seen him do it. The other two players were over on the other side of the fairway, so they weren't aware. When we play, there's money involved. Not a lot, but enough to make this kind of (laughs) behaviour dodgy at least. My quandary is, do I say something about this to the relative? I've been out playing with them several times since this, and I've kept an eye on this lad, but they've been playing together for 20 years. I have no doubt he has done this before. What do you think, fellas? Should I bring it up with him, potentially cause a rift between good mates, or say nothing? I love the podcast and everything you are doing. Wow. So from what I read from that, and I might be quite wrong in this, the guy that's cheated isn't his relative, but it's one of his relative's good friends. So it's kind of like he's got a cousin, an uncle, a dad, whatever, yeah. who's part of this group, and two other random fellas or friends now. And he said they all listen to the podcast. They all listen to the podcast. But in, in some sense, you might have just told him, right now because if, if you're the person listening yeah and you know you've done that there's a high chance you go that's me yeah don't you well you yeah oh, crap i've been caught out here or does this person who's moved the ball six foot even think about what they're doing are they such a cheat they just do it almost subconsciously i love it i think there's a few things ban them from golf no <laughs> <laughs> encourage them to cheat more i i, I Something like this, and it, it's really difficult to do, I think you've got to call it out there and then. I think if it, if it's gone on and it's dwelled and it, it, you know, retrospectively now, how is he just going to bring it up randomly? 
question for you then in what tone so all right let's role play this you're you you're the guy it's a jokey way isn't it? i'm the move, i'm move, all right okay i'm just gonna clean my ball <clears throat> move it with that so i've spotted you spin on my balls wow <laughs> sorry <laughs> pathetic little man all right moved it okay <sighs> so i would kind of this is me marching over all right right just kind of like seven iron eight iron here um just a, a quick one <laughs> just, um i'm pretty sure your ball was behind that tree and i kind of saw you clean it yeah yeah just cleaned it and then you've you you've kind of moved it six foot away six uh, should only no, be, six it foot. should only really be six inches so if you pick that ball back up i'll show you where you can put it properly so if yeah you pick that up because that's obviously that's right. that would be illegal if oh. you hit that now okay i'd have to ban you from this tournament and probably never play golf with you ever again oh, that's a bit strong right so <laughs> So you're going to show me six inches? <laughs> wink, so, wink. So, <laughs> behind this tree. All right, okay. Six inches. Wow. And, and if you want a nice six little, inches? You want a nice little tip, it's about roughly a, a scorecard length. Is it now? So there's a little tip for you. Mark your ball. Okay. And now, now oh, annoyingly for, for you, you're still behind that tree. Am, but don't yeah. worry, you can chip out sideways and you'll still easy make par. Don't do it again, you cheating little... <laughs> <laughs> that was um you did it in a way that made me feel like you were in control of the situation if i was the cheat there i would have felt quite embarrassed and quite i would have gone with it it's almost like so. giving you like a not it's not a telling off it's like a oh i don't know if you're aware that's six foot and not six inches yeah. easy mistake okay so that, that, easy mistake but now that the thing is that's how we should have done it at the time correct but this is Retrospect, several weeks ago i just don't know if you can do it i think you've got to spot him again i think if you spot him again then you've got half a chance. If yeah. it doesn't happen, if you're spotting him and it never happens again, then it might be water under the bridge. On a serious note, this is a bit more of a, of a, a comical situation. Still, it's not a competition, although it is a little bit for money. What's your actual genuine thoughts on cheats? So let's say it's a club comp, but it's a Saturday medal. There's a guy, he hits out of bounds, he gets down there, he moves it six inches, so it's now inbounds, and people either see him or whatever. What's your actual opinion on those people? I think the, the the old saying is like you're only cheating yourself to some degree because golf is a is a game where you have to referee yourself. Yeah, and if you're if you're going down there and you're moving your ball, if it's gone out of bounds and you're bringing it back in or whatever it may be, the way you're cheating it, you're not playing the score that you've actually presented. Correct. You're you're, you're pretending or cheating to get a much lower score than what you've actually got. And and in that sense, it's just damn right wrong, isn't it? You know, got, we play golf, and one one of the things I love about golf is the respect. Mm -hmm. It's the um, self discipline. It's the understanding of the rules, and it's making sure you, like, say, you don't do things like that where you cheat. The more frustrating one for me as well is actually when players cheat their handicaps the opposite way. So you're almost yeah. So the amount of times like I, I've overheard conversations like oh, brilliant, my handicap's gone up today because I'm playing that match on Saturday against that guy and I, I kind of wanted a bad round today. Yeah. You're like, oh, come on. So you're actually, you almost purposely played worse today. You know what? I don't condone cheating in any manner, obviously, but I'd almost someone rather cheat to get a better score than that way. That's what I mean. It's That's almost what I'm worse saying. that. It's like, like, this is like when you go to like a corporate event and you've got three, yeah. do you remember that one we played in? Yes. <laughs> In that uh, a couple was of years a, yeah, ago, was a big... we played in that one and we did a podcast about it. And we, we would talk, you, me, and John Robbins yeah. and Rob Pott, and we played in it. And uh, like the scores were just ridiculous. Yeah. And they, I mean, to be honest, that was a magic pencil day, wasn't it? It was a magic pencil day. But what what's worse is if you go to an event and, you, and you're looking at these guys and, you, and you're thinking, God, they look like good players. Oh, what are you off, fellas? Oh, uh, I'm off like 22 or something. You're like, yeah. I'm not off 22. You're way better than Scratch. that. Scratch. Do you know what I mean? I think that's when it's when it's to go and win prizes at a charity event and things that's like that. That's low. I just think that's really bad. I think it's it's bad in every way. Like you said, it, and it's a bit of a cliche, but you are cheating yourself. You know, golf is a game of, of trust. Certainly, if you know, if you're playing a even a uh, a club uh, match play and it's obviously just two of you, and and one golfer hits the ball left and one goes right. You could clearly or easily prefer your lie if, if it's not preferred lies, or you could find out it's not your ball as a tailor made and just swap it quickly. So there's so many opportunities for golfers to cheat. I think that's one of the things that's so good about golf that most people don't cheat. It's an honest game. Um, well, I mean, it is, yeah. If, if you're going to do that, even if it's a friendly round, so well, how does the friend who emailed us now, next time he's playing golf, if he's, his other friend, the cheat, does find this ball, it's like, well, actually, has he found this ball? Or is he just. Yeah. BSing again. And everyone kind of knows a player like this at their club. There's always a bit of a club cheat, isn't there? I, I think I'm wrong in saying this, I might get shot down for this, but it's so anyone can cheat at golf. You know, that 
there's idiots all over the place and they're all walks of life. But sometimes I think it does come from all the sports. So if you've been a, a footballer, I don't mean a professional, but just, you know, that was what you played growing up or whether it be rugby or any other sport, really, there is some level of not cheating, but kind of lying. So in a simple, I've said this before, I think on the podcast, but let's just say simply we were playing football against each other and I kick the ball and it goes out of, out of play. So it's a throw into your team. How often do people go, oh, no, it's our ball, ref, it come off his ankle last or whatever? Or, you know, even simply you, you trip in the uh, penalty area and you claim it's a penalty and you get rewarded with a penalty. That happens Kids in football. Well, that. That's what I mean. It's kind of like, it doesn't really get classed as cheating, does it? It's more like, I don't know what the word you would even use. Manipulation. Yeah, almost. and I think that is in, in a lot, not every sport, it's very, you know, you can't generalise that much, but in a lot of sports, that is kind of the way uh, the way it works. But I suppose in, in a lot of those sports, you're almost just trying to trick the referee. Correct. Where in golf, there is no, like in professional yeah, golf, there's not in there's normal referees, golf. but like normal golf, there's no referee walking around yeah. with you. I'll tell you what I am always very impressed with, how well the tour players know the rules. To, and they use them to their advantage. Yeah. You know, when they're taking like a drop. Well, that's the, yeah. Like when Jordan Spieth back in like 2018 at Royal Birkdale and he smashed it way right in. Like the intelligence he had to how he needed to drop it and where he needed to drop it to give him the best chance of making five on that hole. I always feel like tour pros really know the rules so well. Well, yeah, that's the thing. That that could cost them a shot, which could cost them a million dollars or whatever. So I don't, I don't have an issue with that if you're using the rules to your advantage. Um, but if you're kind of going to just out and out cheat, oh god, yeah, it's a bit, that, yeah, that, that's it's, totally different. It's wrong, isn't it? Isn't it? Well, like you say, I mean, tour pros have been have suspicions of being cheats as well. Yeah. Um, so I had a list of things to talk about, Rick, and we've kind of hit the end of that list now. So how far in are we, Matt? I want to give you two minutes of freestyle, so you can you, you say whatever you want to say for two minutes. To be honest, I wanted about fifteen minutes on my break seventy five at TPC. You've got Sawgrass. fifteen minutes. Enjoy it. So <laughs> t- break 75. Yes. It's absolutely smashed it. It's had a million views nearly. Yeah, a million views in like five days. Saying There's two things I want to talk about. The little cheeky surprise that people might have heard about in last week's podcast. I just want to oh, yes. not dive into that too much, but people also give, him. A, give a little insight to that. But yeah, break 75 saw grass. Um, we, we, it was your great decision. We released it the Wednesday before the tournament. The amount of feedback, positive feedback we got from viewers saying they love the fact they got to see the golf course with me playing it before the tournament. Yes. It was good. You it know, was. It, I don't know if it I don't know if it highlighted your experience or other people's experience of like almost getting to know the golf course. Yes. Like, you know, because in the break seventy five, it's one hour, eight minutes. It's me playing breaks at Sawgrass, playing very well on the back nine. I shot level par back nine, six over front nine. Sorry to spoil it for people who haven't seen it yet. Um but like it, you really get to see it. The love that Nick, yeah, the caddy guy, he's a cool guy, is ridiculous and very deserving. Um, it, it's mad in America. I mean, certainly in America, like caddy is so much more popular than it is over here, isn't yeah. it? You, certainly you, in these bigger ve- big venues. You get it a little bit like links courses and stuff, don't you? Where it's like a proper resort. But even that is because typically of the influx of like American visitors who almost expect yeah. a caddy. Um, but I think it added. It he, was, he was so good. He was a really cool guy. And I like hearing, you know what I like hearing from caddies? It's how they react to your good and bad shots. Because even when you hit a bad one, you don't want a caddy that's going to talk absolute nonsense. Be like, oh, that was a good hit, mate, even if you have pulled it into the trees. But they go like, okay, well, that's, that's fine. We'll, we'll get, we'll get up and down. Yeah, we'll yeah. find it. We'll get up and down from there, whatever. Yeah. And he was, he seemed like someone that you would want on the bag if you were playing Definitely. competitively. Yeah, he was, he was very, very positive. But like say, it was, it was realistic positivity. Yes. It wasn't a top one in going, oh, unlucky. It was like... <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, not a worry. We, we, you know, we didn't want to hit the green in two anyway. Yeah, it's rubbish. We want to make... We want to make... We want to make bogey. So, so it was that. It, it was very, very, very good. The golf course was spectacular. The 17th. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a hole in golf that genuinely scares you quite as much as that 17th. I obviously haven't played the golf course, um, but I would... Probably agree because JCB 17th, uh, 17th hole, yeah, is a long par three that's like 250 yards downhill Island Green. But because it's so long, and it sounds a bit silly, you almost, 
not expect to hit it in the water, but if you do, it's like, well, it's a dead hard hole. Yeah. It's, it's dead long. Yeah. Where is that? It's 120 yards, yeah. whatever it is. I think you can wedge. play it from all, a, a number of different tees, and obviously depending where the pin is. The day I played it, it was about playing about 118 yards, I think it was. Pin was at the front in that nice little... I must yeah. admit, I do like that pin it's position. One, I'm that. glad it was there. I'd love to play it in Sunday pin position yeah. on the right. I wouldn't like to play it back left. No. I think that's a really hard pin position. Um, but you stood there, and it does... You know, forget the water. I mentioned this in the video. It's not a hard hole. Get rid of the water. It's not a hard. It's an really unbelievably easy par three. But then you obviously add in the water. There is a bit of swaling wind around. It's the pressure. It's the fact you're playing this iconic hole. Arguably, I mean, I, I, some guy disagreed with me on Twitter, but I think it is the most famous par three in the world. Well, what did he say instead? He said the 12th of Augusta. Well, it is a, is a very famous one. I... I... I feel like the old so course the hasn't got any massively famous ones to kind of non golf. It's only got two par threes. Well, yeah. Um, Pebble Beach. Is it Pebble Beach? Oh, it? yeah, the seventh at Pebble Downhill. Beach. But I still I would probably say Sawgrass is. So let me have a look, see if there's a list. It's um, a shame that the um, the camera lads that were with you didn't get to hit any goes on the 17, isn't it? Really a shame. Because I thought Matt, who's behind the camera now, would have loved a, a go on 17. Because you might work in, Matt. Overrated hole, I think. What, can you yeah. just want to tell the listeners? Um, <laughs> so you had you were walking around filming Rick, obviously, on his wonderful break 75, and he very kindly said to you guys, do you want to have a, a shot at this iconic hole? And you had a shot, and what happened? Um... <laughs> I think he blacked out. Yeah. I, think he, I think he forgets that, what's happened It now. was more, it was just tea box and then water, and I was just focusing on the water. Oh, and he just top it in the water? Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. You like back shanked it. But then obviously Rick probably said, Don't have another go and, and redeem yourself. I did think this is where you were going with this conversation. I was I was sweating a bit back here, but So did you, what happened on your second go? Oh Jesus. Follow those two, Harry. <laughs> Mirror image. Okay. Pretty much. But you still can say you've played the whole. I, at, yeah, at, I didn't, didn't finish it. <laughs> <laughs> no, didn't you? Didn't you? Didn't you hit your third shot on the green? Yeah, hole in one on the Sunday pin. Right. Well, what did they move the pin? <laughs> <laughs> if it was there. Well, did you have three goes. Yeah. And then did you actually hole out with that ball? Or? No, I, I I walked off. Okay, fair dues. <laughs> yeah, he hit, he, his third shot that he actually hit it landed. It would have been perfect for a Sunday pin. Well, you can say what most people can't say that you've hit a golf shot at Sawgrass. Now, Harry, one of our other camera. Man, who was there at the time? He was really nervous. Matt seemed dead confident. Yeah, like, unbelie- Harry seemed unbelievably nervous, didn't he, Matt? He he, he did look <laughs> nervous. Harry, <laughs> Harry, <laughs> we're gonna get Harry. We go on this mic a sec with Matt. I was just bringing in Harry. You can't Harry, see him. Ex- hear it. Explain to us about the seventeenth. What, what was your so shot grass. like? My shot was <laughs> um, lucky. It was on the number. Why was it lucky? <sighs> it was magical. It was magical. I mean, normally my yardage is I hit a 52, 120 degree, uh, 120 yards. Yeah. I knew it'd been a long day. I knew I probably wasn't feeling sharp in my golf game. So I knew a 50, <laughs> if I've made contact with a 50, that was the perfect yardage. Yeah. And it was. Yeah. And I don't, I remember looking down, I remember the backswing. It goes black. <laughs> Oh, be phenomenal. Go a bit more. Go. Yes, Harry! Yes, yes, Harry! Yes, One and done, baby! <laughs> <laughs> ah! And then yeah, I just remember looking at the ball in the air and just thinking a sigh of relief that I've actually made contact with the ball. The yeah, ball's in the air. It's, it's going, going forward. I saw it land on the green, and that was it. They made. And then I realised I was actually closest out of everyone that That's hit insane. the shot. He was, about, he was about 10 foot away. Yeah. Did you put it out, or? I did. Yeah. He made I, par. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. Wow. Um, I got a very good read off the caddy. He said it wasn't going very fast, but I thought that's surely not right. We're at Sawgrass 17. Surely it's rolling fast. And it wasn't rolling fast. Slightly oh. uphill. Yeah, slightly uphill. Let the grain. Ju- only just missed, but then, yeah. Tapping past. Uh, how did so you he's, feel? Got, he's got a scorecard now from TPC Sawgrass <laughs> that just par. has a three yeah. on the 17. Yeah, and Rick signed it. <laughs> yeah. so, it's fi- <laughs> so it's an official scorecard. Correct. Well done. And how did you Thanks. feel for Matt? Um... I, I felt bad for Matt. Yeah. Um, he can come back and redeem himself. 
Yeah, he we'll can. We'll go back again. The, yeah. I mean, I was actually expecting quite a lot from Matt. Matt's been practicing <laughs> a lot, but, you know. Matt's been talking a big game. Come on now, lads. You're going to start arguing. Right, <laughs> Harry, go. Thank, we, you. thank you. Thanks thank for you, Thanks, guys. Thank you, Pat. Um, yeah, so it's pretty epic. And then to finish the day, I, I hit an unbelievable tee shot down 18, wedged it in, sunk the birdie putt for 78. He's a man. It, but it, it is just, it, I think it's one of my favourite golf courses. It, yeah, I, I am envious of that one. There's that one and there's King's Barnes that I'm very, very, uh, not envious of maybe, but want to really play. Sometimes when we do a video and I either don't go or I walk around, I'm like, oh, yes, he's cool. But then some courses, like, oh, I need to play that golf yeah, that, course. Yeah, <clears throat> I must admit it was pretty special. But yeah, hopefully it'll hit a million views pretty soon. And then TPC, Sawgrass, if you want me back next year, fine, deal done. Maybe play in the tournament. Yeah, with Tiger and Scheffler. Is that be yeah, that'll be the one that'll be your pick? Would you go with those two? No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know who it'd be with. Um, um, and then and this... then the last thing go on. even though unfortunately still this moment in time, my lips are sealed. Last week's episode got interrupted rudely, but for the right reasons. It did. Uh, I got given a piece of paper with something on it and the information of that will be out very soon. There was lots of guesses. Yeah. I won't say if any was correct or incorrect yet. But lots weren't wrong. Lots were not wrong. <laughs> but lots were also wrong. <laughs> so stay tuned. Hopefully next week an announcement will be made. But I need to go and hit some golf balls and practice. Imagine the official announcement was that you've actually got a handicap. <laughs> and you're coming out, you off 6.7. Be, be, I'm off single figures. Yeah. <laughs> Rick Shields off single figures. Stop press. Brilliant. Guys, thanks for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Be sure to like and subscribe. We shall see you next week for episode 175. Nice. That's how numbers work. Cool. And we'll see you soon. See you later. Bye.